Welcome to The Right to Ricky Sanchez, now on The Ringer Podcast Network. I'm your new host of The Ricky, Bill Simmons. Today's episode is brought to you by our latest sponsor, Job Genius. Ever listen to Chuck Klosterman or Malcolm Gladwell come on the pod and think, hey, why can't the employees at my mid-sized limited liability company be geniuses just like them? Well, now you're in luck. With Job Genius, you only see resumes from certified geniuses with more IQ points than Larry Bird has games in the 238732 Club. Try it now at jobgenius.biz slash BSRTRS. And for every five employees you hire, you get a free pair of double undies, the first underwear but exclusively for two people to wear at once. We're honored to have back on the pod today two-time NBA Finals MVP and number one blog boy, my close personal friend, Kevin Durant. I'm going to ask Kevin why he loves playing basketball, and he's going to repeatedly call me a bitch for asking for two hours. Later on, I'm going to be joined by Spike Eskin and Mike Levin. Levin? Levin? I'll have to ask Judd Apatow about that, since we are friends. We're going to talk about the rights to Ricky Sanchez Process Hall of Fame. Are we sure the process needs a Hall of Fame? John Havlicek never lost for nine years and counting, right? We'll also talk about the Zaire Smith injury and who the real winner is from that. Could it be Demetrius Jackson? I liked what I saw of him as a Celtic. I really did. Finally, I'm going to talk to Andrew Unterberger from Billboard and the column called If Not, Pick Will Convey as Two Second Rounders. That can't be right, can it? Anyway, I'm going to ask him to power rank his top seven Mambos, top 16 Yacht Rock songs, and top 19 Jason Tatum ages. My choices for number one, Mambo number five, Christopher Cross's Sailing, and Jason Tatum's second age 19 season. Now let's get on with the show. But first, run the jewels. We are the murderers there. That with the jail and we murdered the murderers there. Then with the hell and discovered the devil delivered some hurt and despair. Used to have power to push. Now I smoke pounds of the push. Holy, I'm burning the bush. Now I give a fuck about none of this shit. Two runner over and out of this bitch. Step into the spotlight. Welcome to the Rights to Ricky Sanchez podcast, a very special Rights to Ricky Sanchez podcast. I actually don't know if Mike has checked his email, so oh, I, I don't know. I if, did. Okay, so so you know that we had our very special intro yes, to this I love, podcast. I did love it. Okay, so thank you to at Killacow. That was not at, Bill Simmons. That was, was not the real Bill Simmons. Kevin Durant will not be on the podcast. Yes. <laughs> That was one of the greatest things. Um, thank you at Killacal for the Bill Simmons intro. I hope to get more and more of them as the uh, as the year wears on. So before we get to our very special guest on this podcast, and that is one Ben Dietrich, who th- this podcast had to happen. So yep. Ben has been on the podcast before, um, but this one, obviously, with all that's gone on, has to have happened. Um, Mike uh, has a. Before we get to Ben, do you want to do you want to ask Ben to come to your event? Sure, Ben. And if, <laughs> if there's anybody in the New York area or special, specifically on Long Island, Ben, I know how much you love Long Island. I love uh, Long Island. I, how, how could you not? My television show, live in Denver, is playing at the North Fork TV Festival on Long Island on September eighth. And that's a Saturday night. So if anybody is on on Long Island and wants to come, please let me know. And uh, Ben, now that I have you here, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Do you have plans on September 8th? Do you uh, want to take the train with me? I think I, I think I have plans. I'll have to check my schedule. Okay. He's, he's out of town. Out of town. That's a shame. Mm, okay. All right. I'll follow so up ben- on that then. Ben Dietrich, uh, you know from the internet, most likely. He's got a, uh, an NBA podcast called Cookies, uh, which is a good podcast. He writes for different outlets, but uh, you might know him most from formerly writing from Grantland, but then writing the, the piece that ended the Brian Colangelo era, essentially, for the Philadelphia 76ers for the ringer.com. That is Ben Dietrich. Ben, I can't tell you how excited we are to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. I think it's been a uh, 
um, two years, and yeah, definitely some things have changed. So mm-hmm. it's nice to be yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. So we we had you on as a guest, but you also uh, I don't know if you know there's some new people, some people that have been around. We did a reading of the Hinky uh, uh, retire not retirement uh, resignment letter on the podcast and everyone read a different page and you read one of those pages. So, so if you go back to the annals of Ricky history, that's another place that you can hear and Ben. Another, cl- another clue in the feather of the cap of the people who think <laughs> Ben made this all up. <laughs> yeah. Someone who would, who would diligently read a page of a written letter on right. a podcast, not knowing yep. that a couple years later, he would be instrumental in taking down <laughs> his successor yeah i mean mm. look it's a great it's a it's a wild simulation we're living in guys <laughs> yeah really it sure is. is so let me get, let me gr- get right into it and i, I want to ask you the biggest picture question i can i can ask you because i've brought this up on the podcast and i mentioned it to the ringers chris ryan at one point i mentioned it to uh, a guy that we all hate andrew sharp one time and c- can you ha- do you have proper perspective or could you put into words the the incredible irony and coincidence that it, of all people it was you that would have this story like is well, it as crazy to you as it is to to me because i don't think anyone understands how crazy that is i think it's very surreal and it still does not seem like a sensible way that things played out i also do want to say that when i understood the scale of the story and the stakes for myself and for the ringer and for the editors and for the team and for the the front office and for the players and the nba etc cetera, etc cetera. those personal feelings that i had about how brian colangelo was hired or, or his job performance that was so out of the window i mean this was work you know i mean i get what you're asking and it does seem strange that i was someone who was a critic of him and then ended up being someone who wrote this article but from a professional standpoint, those feelings were really exercised while working on the story. And when he resigned, there wasn't like jubilation or gloating yeah. or feeling like vengeance or anything like that. It was just sort of a I was more awestruck by the fact that you had this anonymous source and you had this group of, of people working on the story and then you had Twitter and you had Reddit and you had all these people digging in and finding out more information and sort of pushing the story to its conclusion. And that was more exciting to me than the idea of, of uh, you know, of taking down someone in that way. Hmm. The- I, don't, I don't believe you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, I, I well, definitely it- believe that the, I, I was talking before in terms of you making this all up. But I, I would find it hard to, uh, to divorce yourself entirely from the idea that, look, you don't like this guy. You don't like the way he managed the team. You don't like the way he carried himself. And here you are digging through either his or his wife's or his uh, father's or something personal secret account spilling all of these secrets that was a sensational story in its own right, but also compounded by the fact that, legitimately, you don't like this guy. So I, 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 I not, I'm not questioning your ability as a professional, as a journalist, but we know that all, everybody's guided by their own biases and, and ethos, and whether there's journalistic in, uh, in, integrity or not. It's still, well, I think early, it still on, a factor. early on, because obviously the Sixers and his tenure or something that I've been paying close attention to and we argue about and we debate. So seeing this sort of the the underpinnings of his ideology or whoever was writing those tweets and extending his ideology, that was incredibly interesting. And to your point, it was things that I cared about. But at the same time, I mean, I'm telling you, by the time that this story reached its conclusion, it was just more relief. It was more being proud that we got the story correct, that we presented it in the right way, that it ended up in a place that we could look at and say, we did this story and we did the work the right direction. You know, those those feelings that you're referring to, that may have happened early on where it was like, holy shit, maybe this is this guy. Maybe this is someone tied to this person. Maybe this is, 
you know, a piece of information that, that fills in the blanks. Yeah, I knew he was a fuckface, et cetera. <laughs> well, well, okay. That, so I, I think that's interesting in that. So this is different in 2018, oh, not because Twitter exists. Like, let, let's let's make pretend that um, that this story could have happened in a different way 20 years ago, you know, letter writing, whatever it was. <laughs> Well, no, I'm just saying in 2018, I think the line for because everyone can write something on the Internet and you are not everyone, right? You wrote for New York Times, for Grantland, for The Ringer. You are an an actual journalist and an actual writer. But I think what is what is makes it harder for people to fathom sometimes is that because we all have a platform and to an extent we all see ourselves as like – you know, from from 100 followers to 100,000 followers as some sort of like a uh, public uh, thinker or uh, or journalist. And then the other thing is that the way that that Twitter sort of operated in in figuring out other clues after the story had come out, I think is what makes it um, most it was what makes the line most blurred, at least visually, for most people, whereas you are operating as a guy who writes a story to a certain extent, but everyone else sort of sees themselves on, on a similar plane as you. Does that make any sense? I think it does. Yeah. So, whatever. Do you ever, how often, I guess, because I would imagine you do, how often do you wonder about who that person was that sent you that initial message? Almost never, to be honest, because my gut instinct is that it's, not someone who is known to people who are even rabid basketball fans. Mm-hmm. That's just my, my gut instinct. I'm wrong all the time. But it doesn't strike me as that there is a huge part of this story that is about who that person was. And, you know, I remember on the Dan LeBetard story, uh, show, they asked me, did you, you know, did you vouch that source? And I was like, well, they were pointing at stuff that existed online and some of it for for two years so to me it wasn't that there was this piece of information that was unverifiable it was like look at this stuff that's on the internet that's been there and you look through it and you comb through it and this is where it points so i wasn't that you know i i mean you obviously want to know if this person is a scam artist if this is a a catfish it's a hoax but in terms of knowing the exact identity it's not something that i really like toss and turn about the the interesting thing for me is that uh, while The Ringer definitely does uh, hard journalism, uh, they're primarily a takes-based company and like a speculative... I agree. It's a, takes, it's a takes-based economy. Takes-based economy, that's right. <laughs> and, and you yourself as well. Uh, We're all takesmen that's on right. this podcast. We all love our takes. But, but what's interesting to me is when, when in the article, it was obviously very meticulously written and edited and combed through to make sure that there wasn't uh you weren't tipping anything you were just like presenting the facts and more facts came out afterwards as you said on twitter and reddit and all that stuff and then in the podcast that you and chris ryan did uh afterwards which was for the most interesting story in nba history the worst podcast i've ever heard in my life (laughs) uh and that's why we had you on here to ask the real questions because chris you guys couldn't talk about on there it uh was it weird to be on the other side of, of where you have to, you have all these uh, op- opinions and your own takes, but you, you have to just sort of let, let the facts play out as it was, and then you sort of opt out of tweeting about this crazy controversy that normally, had you not been the one to report it, you would have been obviously speculating out your ass forever? Well, sort of, because for me, writing about basketball was sort of a newer development and it is more of a takes based economy Mm -hmm. when you tie in doing podcasts and 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 tweeting all that kind of stuff but my actual background for i don't know 15 years has been doing like journalism and for the most part is not opining on things it's reporting so i mean i probably have over 200 300 i don't even know bylines the new york times and most of that stuff is not me doing hot takes it's me (laughs) interviewing people and getting quotes and I mean I've done stories about murder and drug raids so you know I I think people just know me in the context of like basketball take machine 
but that's not really who I am as a writer. So I don't know. I'm not saying that to like gas myself up as like some paragon of journalism, but I just, it just was not strange to me from a, a writing standpoint. Interesting. How, I feel gas. So up. you, what you, <laughs> So, so this this was between obviously, and I, I think a lot of people who follow the story remembered this. From the time you started this to the time you reported it is a lot of time. Um, not a lot of time in terms of reporting a story. That stuff happens all the time. But like you know, given that Brian Colangelo is out there being a GM and all of these things, it seems like a long time not to say anything. Yeah. Um, how hard was that? I guess now, uh, how hard was it to to not mention it? Yeah, it was strange having this nugget of information and, and not to say it, who it pointed at specifically, but there was this growing body of information. As you saw, you had not only material from dating back to, um, you know, literally years, but on a daily basis. And sometimes these accounts were tweeting five, seven, ten times a day. So, yeah, it was really weird not to talk about the Sixers when you had this inside information, so to speak. But also at the same time, I think it was totally fascinating because when something would occur, you were just waiting for like the burners to chime in on it. So I thought that was, that was, that was like, like, all right, what are the burners going to say about this one? This is crazy. <laughs> I had never thought of that, that, that you knowing they existed, you could, when something would happen with the Sixers, you could, look at them i i it's sort of like having someone's like phone bugged yeah no, it was it was really really fascinating because i had never thought of that yeah something would like the trade deadline would come up or something you're like oh what are the burners going to say about this <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome what did so so the story comes out and uh it i would guess and i think you said this in your in your terrible podcast with chris is that um <laughs> that it was <laughs> It was bigger, you had even mentioned this, that it was bigger than you thought it was going to be. You thought it was going to be a, wow, isn't this silly, and sort of go away. As it gains steam, and it's like, this guy looks like he's going to be fired, and I don't know if you can talk about it, but like, there are some questions, uh, you know, obviously the, the microscope goes on you, and goes on the ringer, and goes on Chris, and all this stuff about what's really going on here. Did, was there, how much concern was there, did I really get this right or like or am I wrong or is something going to come out that makes me look bad like you know during that time what was the feeling like well when the f story first came out and everyone started talking about it I remember I was at a restaurant and all of a sudden the story had dropped and it was like I looked at my phone and it was just going crazy and you know it was like mentions were just coming in so fast and it was literally like hundreds a minute and that was strange but then when everyone was talking about the story it didn't seem weird initially because it had been something that was consuming me and something that I had been talking about constantly with, with my editors for, the, for the, you know, the time leading up to it. So it felt almost like being a part of a normal story that we're all talking about in that way, like, oh, yeah, finally, we're all talking about this thing that's on my mind. But, right, the story just started getting larger and you had LeBron James making jokes about it mm -hmm. and Adam Silver being asked about it. And... I think for me, the only thing that was a little that added to the, the surrealism of it was that it took, I believe, nine days for the Sixers to come to a conclusion. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're second guessing all your stuff. You're looking at your sources. You're like, well, it seems like this is right. I, I trust our work. But that delay, there's nothing you can do. So you're just sort of there like reviewing your own stuff. And I think that can lead to a second guessing, you know, as I said, when the story sort of reached its conclusion, it wasn't celebratory. It was it was just kind of like, all right, I can move on. That's there's a sense of relief in that regard. What were you surprised that it took the Sixers as long as it did to make a decision? Uh, from the people I spoke with, they sort of explained why it was taking that long, and then it made sense, and that they were dealing with powerful people, and there were large amounts of money involved in contracts and doing it in a very deliberate way instead of a knee-jerk way was the proper way to go about it mm -hmm. you know while you guys are putting up billboards and like <laughs> yeah i was like <laughs> i'm like i get why they're being you know why they're being diligent about this and 
and doing it in a certain tortoise like method. Like it, it, it made sense from a, a legal standpoint. But but I want to you probably I want, were, I want to be uh, oh go ahead, Mike. But, but you probably were there was some part of you that was like, Man, are they gonna fucking keep this guy? Right? I mean, I, I think we all sort of wondered what was going to happen, you know, when Paul Weiss's firm was brought in, and then they made their announcement that the accounts had been tied to, like, I guess I believe they used forensically tied to <laughs> um, <laughs> Brian Colangelo's wife's phone, and et cetera. Right. I, I mean, I didn't know what they were going to find. I thought the sort of case that we had put together with the internet and then you know, assembling more of it was, it looked right. It made sense. But yeah, I, I, as it delayed, I think, I think everyone who sort of was interested in it had that same sort of response. Like, like maybe they're just going to let this thing die down. I, I want to be clear that we did not take out a billboard for this. Um, <laughs> we only took out a billboard one time. It was a correct time to do it. Yeah. And we are, you know, everybody else wants to take out billboards, but we are very careful as to when we take out you billboards. Judicious. Billboard very judicious. Take your outers. Come on. I mean, the, you know, when, when the first billboard you take out is when they force Hinky out and you take it out right outside the Wells Fargo Center. You got to think very carefully These about what you're doing. These billboard amateurs, dude. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we take a break from the podcast to talk about Mike, live Ricky number three. Dario is coming over September 22nd at the Electric Factory, 8 wow. p.m. Dario on stage with us, process Hall of Fame induction speeches. And, uh, and, and we've begun planning our, our other special things, which some we'll announce and some will be surprises at, yeah. the, at the show. But very, I, very, very exciting. I talked on the phone to one of our surprises yesterday, in fact. Oh, oh really? Um, uh, was this person, I, w I don't want to give away gender, was this person excited to be part of the, the live show? I would say very. Wow, that's exciting. Well, everyone's excited to be part of it. I don't know if Dario is. Uh, I, I can't imagine he's thought about it very much. But So the VIP tickets are you know, sold out. I disagree. Out. I, disagree. No. I, bet he's thought, oh, really? I bet he's thought about it a lot. I bet, <laughs> really? I bet, he's, re I bet he's really thinking about it a lot. He's, <laughs> he, I think he's maybe probably a little nervous about it, or at least just curious about how it's going to go. Will, what, if, what if, I mean, you know, what if he has anxiety about, like, will the fans react to him the way that they did for TJ? And well, tell they you, will. I'll tell you. They will. Uh, yeah. The, the roof will raise off when Dario is there. So here's the deal on tickets. VIP tickets are sold out. They sold out in minutes. Many people were angry about how quickly they sold out. And there are some general admission tickets left. They are $29.99 in advance. They are $35 until if you wait to the day of the show. It is all ages. It's the first all ages live, Ricky, which is really good news. Um, I'm trying it to is, think what it else. It is good news. I was, I've been uh, it's great sad news. about it. This is the first yeah. one, aside from the lottery party. Yeah, but that, as you determined, that is not an official live Ricky, True. even though there was a live pod there. Yeah, so the of the live Ricky events, the exclusive live Ricky events, this is the first one that's all ages, which is really exciting. Uh, it is general admission, but there will be seats for everyone, so it's a, a seated event. Uh, the show will start at 8 o'clock. We'll open the doors at 6.30 so we can have a happy hour beforehand. If you want tickets, go to rightstorickysanchez.com. I urge you not to wait. We are very excited, many surprises, and Dario on stage with us in what is sure to be, I mean, it'll be hard to top TJ for a hilarious level, but I, I would put my money on at least even money for Dario to be funnier, the Dario one to be at least as funny as the TJ one. I think, I think in a very different way. I think yes, it'll be, very, It's very going to be an event. It's going to be something else. The fact that it's at the Electric Factory is another just element to it. Yeah, the fact that it's at the, one of the mo most famous concert venues in Philadelphia, um, just in, in the juxtaposition of of that, and and just who Dario is yeah. as a as a uh, <laughs> as like a um, as a as a, as a um, I can't even find the words. That's how something <laughs> I am. It's just like the aura around it. Well, it's a symbol of a lot a of symbol things. And also, yeah. and also just like who he is yeah. in, in the context of a conversation. I'm excited. About It'll that. be awesome. So we look forward to seeing you there. Get your tickets. Uh, RightStrickySanchez.com. And now back to the podcast. So I, uh, two very silly things I have to ask about is 
you know, in a weird way, uh, you become, um, you know, you say you're thinking about this clinically, but then you sort of, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Twitter accounts were giving out information that, that made some of the players look bad and, and gave out, you know, medical information. And I, I think there were a lot of people that were angry about what was going on with the Twitter accounts and felt relieved and happy when he finally got fired when they found out they were doing this. So you become, of course, this uh, process like hero in some way. And uh, I, I'm sorry that we are responsible for some of this, but the, uh, you know, what is it like having hundreds of people changing their Twitter avatars to your picture. And then like there are t-shirts, you know, there are t-shirts around with your face on this it. This is all stuff all that you this. did though. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what was it but like I mean, to experience the things that I did that I, that I, well, but, that but I, you that are I the foisted guy. upon you. Great response, ben. Perfect response. <laughs> well, well, but the truth is, but you're the one that has to deal with it. Right. So what does that feel? What is, like, what is my shit like? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, it, it definitely fed into the, the, as I said, the surrealism of the entire moment. <laughs> and just to backtrack quickly, though, when yeah. I was saying I dealt with it in a clinical way, I absolutely believe that there was something, um, there was a violation of of trust that was occurring. And there was sort of a, you know, put quotes around it, crime that we were trying to prevent from occurring, if that makes sense. I, I don't want to say I didn't have emotions about it because I did think what was happening was wrong. I, I just want to make sure I'm sort of yeah. clarifying that. Specific, it wasn't just this, specifically what did you think was wrong? I, the l- revealing of information mm-hmm. that was seemingly organizational secrets and continually pushed to members of the press to write negative articles about players on the Sixers. That was morally reprehensible to me when you consider where that information seemingly was coming from. But don't you think that kind of happens anyway, just not on a fake Twitter account? Wouldn't doesn't that happen like couldn't couldn't um, you know, let's say Daryl Morey or anyone. Let's not let's pick a less processed guy. Uh, couldn't R. C. Buford uh, reach out to anybody in the San Antonio press and be like, hey? Uh, we're trying to trade this guy, and we want public public su- support for him to be a little bit lower. Like, can you write some of this stuff? Like, I mean, I feel like that kind of stuff happens, doesn't it? I'm sure it happens all the time. I I would not disagree with that at all. And is I it, don't think and I don't it, think doing it is is as uh, I, I think that's just a part of these this gamesmanship of yeah. of, of professional sports. You know, you have agents leaking, you've got general managers leaking, you have players leaking. But to see this sort of single-minded focus on one agenda, and for example, I couldn't count these specific times, but the amount of times that those accounts claimed that Jaleel Okafor had failed a physical, in the hundreds maybe? You know, it, it wasn't like, here's some information that's getting leaked out via an alternative method. It was like, you can see these accounts talking to Bodner, talking to Woj, talking to all these different people and repeatedly trying to get them to do interviews, to write these stories. And that was just really unseemly. Mm -hmm. Which... Um, Oh, go ahead. Which of the five accounts was your favorite? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Which were you like... I'm a still still balling guy. Still balling guy. Oh, wow. (laughs) Still balling was the one that was most in real time that I was following. That Still balling was, was like... I'm like, what's still balling got to say about this today? Cool. I muted that I one. Think, that one was muted I th- for me. I think we I, I all muted, did. I had muted it as well, yeah. <laughs> I think we all did the thing when when the names of the accounts came out. You're like, ooh, do they follow me? And yeah. then, ooh, oh, I do have them muted. Oh, wow. That was, that really was good. quick. Really <laughs> good. What was your yeah. reaction when you realized that they spelled enough unknown sources wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was my reaction. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, I, but we always referred to it when we're talking about en- is enough uncone sources. Yeah, it's yeah uncone. I really yeah, felt like I, I had to be, you know, accurate. It wasn't yeah, enough so. unknown sources. It's enough uncone sources. <laughs> I, I think I can predict next Mike's next question. Why do you think they censored butt? Uh. <laughs> 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 as far as I can recall, there was no cursing whatsoever. Everything always had an, an asterisk or spaces yeah. or something in there. There was no no cursing on any of the accounts. But Ben specifically, okay. but 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so here's a question. We, we talked, Andrew Unterberger for our site wrote a thing about his wife, just like, you know, the, the, the context in which she will be remembered in all of this. And we went through, you know, we did a lot of podcasts during this whole thing. And we went through moments where we started thinking about them as people and as a couple and thinking about her as a, a wife that is trying to defend her husband. Where, you know, who knows? You know, I, I think we all believe that there was probably more than one. I'm saying this, Ben's not saying this, but uh, that there was more than one person with access to these accounts. But surely she was one of them. Did you ever feel, did you ever think about them as people and think about her as a person and, and maybe feel bad about any of it? It's obviously a tough situation for a family to deal with. Right. I, in terms of who said what, I don't know. There are some of the, some of the tweets, for example, compared Nerland's Noel as a uh, bad locker room guy to Mark Aguirre. And if I don't know where that reference is coming from, is that something that a, you know, mid fifties Italian born woman is going to have that reference point? I don't know. I don't want to say I'm, I'm a sexist. I'm not saying she couldn't have that, but to your point, this information was coming from one place it, as I mean, I'm, I'm trying to phrase this the right way. I just mean, I couldn't really separate who was doing what to what, because the information was coming from one place. And after I called the team and the accounts went down within an hour or whatever it was, you know, I, I was hard to sort of single out who was doing what, if, if I can say that in a tactful way. Yeah. What, right. what was your reaction when the accounts went down, when the Sixers acknowledged the existence of some of the accounts and then you saw them go down? I was surprised when they acknowledged the one. Yeah. Uh, I, I just didn't think they would. Because and, they could have just not said, they could have said fuck off, right? Yeah, I, you know, I. that was the one that we looked at and we said, this is, the thought, like they hadn't done anything incriminating, but based on the followers, it was someone who clearly worked for the Sixers organization. There was just no way it wasn't. And then combined with the other followers from different channels of the sort of Colangelo family's life, it it was it was almost certainly someone who was in the Sixers organization and was tight with all these people. So I was not surprised that it was confirmed as him. I was surprised that they confirmed it. If, I don't know if that makes sense, but no, that, that like, I kind sense. of was like I, yeah. I was like it makes total sense that this account is him. And I was surprised though when they said, "Yeah, that's him," and this one's not. And I was like, "Yeah, but they're we've got these things tying them together." Well, I, I think that's pretty indicative of the disconnect internally between what he admitted to and what they what the, the people you were communicating with, which is, I imagine, PR or, or whatever they are, um, actually knew. And that that was like the because I would imagine if, I, if I'm doing if I'm communicating with you and Brian assures me that the one is him and we know that one has done nothing wrong and it, it seems reasonable that a, a you know he would have an account like that and assures me that the others are not him that it probably makes the most sense to come clean about the one because that way it gets you off off their back it's just it's I would love to have seen and to have a recording of all of the internal conversations that went around and, you know, and how it developed internally mm. uh, as opposed to what we found out. I would pay you know, so much money for that. Yeah. I never felt as if dealing with the people from the Sixers organization that they were they were dishonest with me. I, no. never, I never felt that was the case. I never felt like they were anything but professional. Um, and when they came back with that, if we're looking at it the way that things shook out, that they didn't even come back with anything that was untrue. You, you know, if, if we're saying they said this is his account, they said this one is not, and the way that it shook out, that doesn't even contradict what eventually was sort of decided by, by uh, Paul Weiss. Yeah. Uh, I want to read something back to you from the article, if you don't mind, uh, on the ringer.com. The still bowling account, which had been tweeting daily, has not posted since the morning of the 22nd. I had already been following Still Balling with an anonymous account, account of my own, which allowed me to see activity after it went private. Since I contacted the Sixers, Still Balling has unfollowed 37 accounts with ties to the Colangelos, including 
several of his son's college basketball teammates, a former coach from his son's high school, and an account that shares the same name as the agent Warren Legary, who has represented Colangelo in the past. My question to you, Ben, is what is your anonymous account, and are you as bad as he is? (laughs) My anonymous account was just a watching account, and it was one that was like, I was like Sixers legacy Ben Simmons MVP, <laughs> like rookie of the year, and just re- and just retweeted praise of Ben Simmons over and over and over. Oh, so you so that. you built that out? Yeah, because I I knew the accounts. That not that many people followed the accounts. Sure. They were they were always pushing information, but they weren't tweeting. Sure. Wow. So I followed it. I knew that the accounts were really into Ben Simmons. So I made like a a Ben Simmons rookie of the year account and followed it. Wow. And how much work did you put into making that seem real? I mean, there's almost some level of Sasha Baron Cohen to that. I, I mean, I never tweeted with it. It was just, I just re, I probably spent two or three days, maybe a week or so, and just retweeted a bunch of crap and then eventually followed the the account. So it didn't look like I had created it to follow. It. Oh, wow. So you, you, you knew you were going to follow him with this, yeah. with this, uh, so with I this created private account? Like, I probably created it like a month before I followed him. Oh, man. This I, is good. I love this whole. I you know reliving this this morning. I believe it or not, as crazy as this whole insane story was, I have not thought about this story at all for weeks and weeks. Well, it's too crazy. It, yeah. So so we're talking about it now again is is reminding me how uh, crazy and hilarious the whole thing is. This must rank. I and I was initially going to ask you in terms of the Sixers of the last five years, but. I think in all time sports stories, this has to be top three crazy, top five crazy. I don't even know what would be in the same stratosphere. Put your take hat on, Ben, for this one. Yeah, what's your what's your take on that? Well, you've got stories like the ones with the, the Dallas Mavericks and you know the, yeah. the, the sexual harassment within the organization. I feel like that's like a a, a important story of course obviously in terms of a less crazy more institutional and upsetting right and 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 perhaps more important you know in terms of changing the culture of the nba and people seeing that and wanting to avoid that sort of public shaming and etc totally we're not talking about importance this was not an important story right this was just fucking crazy that's what i mean in terms of something just being fucking bonkers yeah I, i don't know i it's it's also strange in that it was broken through a, a publication versus something that just happened, you know, where you right. had like DeAndre Jordan going to the Mavs and then rescinding it and going back. But that wasn't broken. It, right. it didn't, it, it, it happened. Like the NBA is crazy. Insane things happen all the time. But in terms of a story, I, it's hard for me to think of one that kind of mushroomed into something well, also as funny, just yeah. surely as funny. <laughs> I, I feel well, bad for you that you were the one to break it, that you were not able to enjoy it with the rest of us in some sense. Yeah. I mean, ru- I was watching it. You ruined guys. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> How long did you stay off Twitter from, for like after it happened? And like, not stay off Twitter, but like, you know, because you were silent. You sort of let it play out. You watched as Detective Legs did his work and everybody, uh, more things were uncovered. People were doing all this stuff. How how long how hard was it to stay stay like silent and how just it was actually really was easy like? to stay silent it was super easy just because there were so many eyeballs on me and i didn't want things i said in the immediate i didn't, I didn't want like to add to the story in a way that wasn't productive right you know just commenting yeah. on it doesn't push it forward it doesn't change anything for the better so i mean i made one or two little tweets sort of over the the next week or so uh, yeah, I didn't think I could be productive is really what it came down to. Sure. How hard was it to live you your know, life? Like, <laughs> with this knowledge, like beforehand and after, we asked, Spike asked how hard, how hard it was to not say anything, which I think is a great question. I, I think you answered it well. But how hard, how hard is it to like walk around like you're going to a bodega and you're getting like a, <laughs> like a juice and you're, you're like, man, I'm the guy that broke this fucking Colangelo thing. Like, are you, are you like looking over your shoulder a little bit? Like, are you scared? Or are you like, Should I? you Should walking I in looking out for, for, you know, guys in pinstripes? <laughs> I don't know. With the, with the college. Uh, I mean, are you like walking in like, like, look at my big swinging dick or are you walking in like there's somebody that's going to come, come attack me? I mean, I, I'm not really concerned about those things. I think it's, it's weird when I'm hanging out with 
group of people and there might be guys who don't know me or women who don't know me and a friend will be like, oh, by the way, he's the guy who wrote this story and the person will be a basketball fan all of a sudden. It's just like, wait a minute, what? Huh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it becomes just like, it, it's a very sort of repetitive conversation. It's not sure. something that's negative, but, you know, because it's, it's generally acclaim. So it's, it's nice to hear, but it's very similar. But it is funny because it just happens every now and then. Someone would be like, oh, you like basketball? Well, check this out. <laughs> and then, like they're like well, being displayed like a <laughs> like a little like weird trophy to to go back uh just one thing about the craziness of the story i remember doing an interview with uh you know my company in philadelphia owns radio stations that aren't sports stations and they had me on a like a regular talk station to explain this whole thing and we're talking about how crazy it was but when you talk about it it is crazy but it is also entirely believable when you think about the human condition and, and social media and, and relatable. And like when you think about relationships, I even brought up a story when we were talking about when I got engaged and it was on a local website and my wife was mad that the comments were making fun of me. Um, like, you know, if, on some level, all of this is really sort of normal as, as crazy as it is too, right? I think it's an entirely 2018 story, and, and it involves older people on the internet, which generally leads to calamity. <laughs> and it all, <laughs> I just mean, it's true. You know, it's like boomers logging on, like, let's see where this goes. <laughs> but if you, if you look at the story itself, I, I think one interesting thing is that there is no expectation that a, a spouse would not tell their spouse things about their work. I think everyone understands that's the case. And everyone understands that people are liable to vent online. But it was sort of the, the stars aligning in this particular situation that turned something that was pretty understandable and pretty human into something that was kind of totally insane. Mike, if it's okay, I wanted to, if you don't, I, I only had, I had a couple of actual Sixers questions. Oh, but no, I, don't know I have Mike so had much any. more. So yeah. much more. I could talk about this forever. I've been waiting for this for a long time because <laughs> we wanted to let it die down before we had you back on. Yeah. Uh, so we could really get into it. The an, Another point in the article, uh, you said that the accounts boasted that the critically panned December 2017 trade of Julia Logo for Nick Stauskas and the second round pick for Trevor Booker, quote, sounds better and better. <laughs> now that Trevor Booker is playing in China and uh, was, was cut a month and a half after acquiring him. Uh, do you agree that it did sound better and better? I think if there's one trade that embodied the last few years, it would be the Julio Okafor, a second round pick, and Nick Stauskas for Trevor Booker. That would be the nutshell of the, the era's uh, player transactions sounding better and better. And and specifically keeping Okafor and Stauskas uh on the roster going into the season so that they, they could make that trade <laughs> better and better. <laughs> and, and, and even before that, backing that up a little bit more trading up to draft Andrzej Spisetniks and not being able to draft Josh Hart or Kyle Kuzma because there simply wasn't space on the roster because you better had to, and <laughs> you had better. to have the wheel and Saskas to then make the trade for Trevor Booker, which sounds again, better and better. Yeah. That's sounding better and better to me. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, the one thing that this did do, and I, I do hearken back to some of our podcasts during the time, is one positive thing out of all of this is that it did open people's eyes to what I believe was uh, a bad job done by Colangelo. And like, um, I, I think it, it gave everyone a little bit of a pause to look back and go, well, this is great, and the team is fun and great, and the players are really good, but wait a minute, what the hell has been going on here? And I think this story made people do that in a way that they might not have done it otherwise. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I mean, I don't know what the sort of mainstream take on the Sixers was under, you know, in terms of how they viewed him. I think there was almost this void in judgment. It yeah. was just sort of like, okay, the team's back in the hands of a traditional GM and we can and we can just talk about like the young guys on the team I, I, there was actually very little criticism or even analysis of what he had done outside of sort of Sixers diehards so I, I do think to some degree it did put say like the Fultz trade and and 
the Noel trade and the Okafor trade in a little bit more relief. I think I think that's probably accurate. What is your favorite specific from this story? Like, because there's so many nuggets over the course of reading this article. When I read for the first time, the other uh, thing is maybe the other stuff that I time. have, dude. Dude, I've got a lot of stuff that never came out. Let's hear it. Oh boy, give us one thing. Can you give us one thing? I can. I can. Okay. So, oh yes. So this is. There was another story that we were going to put out, but it felt like it would be sort of a. Uh, it felt unnecessary after the the teams had reached its uh, its conclusion. We take a break from this uh, right to Ricky Sanchez podcast to talk ben, to you. Sit um, right there. It's probably yeah, gotten right there, pretty man. testy by now. That's my yeah. guess. <laughs> is that we will have uh, confronted him. Yep. And he's defensive. Confronted him? I don't what know. were we confronting? I don't know. We'll find out. All right. Sit right there, Ben, as we talk about our sponsor, <laughs> Big Barker Dog Beds. So, uh, Mike, you know, one thing I hadn't told you yet that I discussed with Eric from Big Barker is that, you know, we want to find ways to integrate all of our sponsors at the Live Ricky. And I was like, how about we put two Big Barkers up on stage and we pick out two people from the audience to sit on stage on the Big Barkers at the Live Ricky, (laughs) which I think is awesome. So we're going to do that. So, look, a lot of times when we talk about our sponsors, we talk about the people that like own or run the place. And I haven't done that a ton with Eric and Big Barker. So Big Barker is a therapeutic dog bed that really supports dogs' joints. As they get older, they develop arthritis and, and sleeping on those normal shitty dog beds is is bad for those dogs and a big barker is good for those dogs so eric uh, is from philadelphia and is a a big sixers fan but most importantly to me for this uh, because i care about dogs so much is that the reason he put this thing together is because he had a really big dog named hank uh, rest in peace hank and he wanted what was best for hank so he thought there's these big dogs you know most notably dogs that are 50 pounds or more mm-hmm. that sleep on these bad beds that develop arthritis and you know it's hard for them to get around as they get older and he was like we need to do better for dogs which is a great reason to start a dog bed company and he really did it these the beds are awesome uh, my dog, Rebel, sleeps on one. Donovan, your dog, also sleeps on a big barker. Mm-hmm. If you want your dog to sleep on a big barker, which you should because it's the best thing for your dog, go to bigbarker.com slash Ricky. That's bigbarker.com slash Ricky. Get your big barker dog bed with the free Ricky upgrade, a cover for the dog bed with a tastefully embroidered right to Ricky Sanchez logo on it. Then you send us a picture of that dog on the bed, and we make that dog a process pup on right to Ricky Sanchez.com. We got one this week from Australia which is incredible. So that's up there on the website. Um, get the bed. I'm telling you, it's worth every penny. Uh, it's got a 10-year warranty. Foam won't flatten or they'll replace it for free. A one-year at-home trial. If you don't like it, they will even pay for the shipping to send it back. And it is handmade in the USA. Big Barker dog beds. <laughs> and now, I'm back ask, to the I'm, podcast. I'm gonna, let's, replace it. let's replace that with Ben doing a bark at some point. Let's, let's trick Ben into doing a bark during this conversation. Okay. And if we don't, now back to the podcast. <laughs> All right. But there was a lot of stuff that the burner account said that was about non-Sixers. So, for example, um, they did not like LeBron James, which I thought was pretty interesting. And yeah, example, that's a curveball. Like, I admit I am a LeBron hater, not as a player, but for the condescending bore he is, wrote <laughs> enough uncone sources. <laughs> he dismissed comparisons to Ben, what an awesome, quote, big brother. Um, there was another one where they said they were sick of LeBron's beards. While this guy whines a lot, they said about LeBron, mm-hmm. I'm fed up with LeBron and his beard. Um, they accused Daryl Morey of not letting... Um, and I'm, I'm inferring here of letting a loved one not go to MIT because of a, a, a uh, personal, personal reasons. And that would seem to imply via these accounts, they're talking about their son. So there's a lot of really wild stuff in there that to me, them, the accounts talking greasy were less of an issue than the ones about the Sixers. Mm-hmm. You know, there's stuff Did- about... Greg Popovich and the Spurs, like mocking the Spurs for not being good and how the, 
ideal organization has fallen apart without Tim Duncan, um, saying that the Spurs leak information to Woj. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that, that never did really come to light because the story sort of reached its end point in terms of the media. There's only so much you can you can digest. <laughs> it got Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I when I heard you mention on Cookies about the Spurs stuff, and uh, it really put into perspective the. I think we all thought on at an, on a number of occasions that Brett Brown's tenure as coach was shaky once Brian Colangelo took over, but a lot of the anti-Spurs stuff to me read like anti-Brett stuff, and I think that he was probably closer. Like they, I, my guess is they were just waiting for the moment to get rid of him, and they just never got it. I, and, I would uh, totally agree. Yeah, it's crazy. And the LeBron stuff is really curious because I, I always got the sense that he thought he really had a chance at getting LeBron James. And maybe that was wife stuff and not him stuff, but I really thought that he was angling to that like that was the, going to be the feather in his cat that he really believed he had a chance at yeah i don't i don't know i, I yeah. the accounts i feel as if there are clearly sh- opinions that could be shared and maybe there's ones that aren't i don't know yeah um you yeah. know for example i thought the spurs stuff was interesting because you know we now think of that hatchet being buried because of usa basketball and this decades-long simmering tensions between the Suns and the Spurs that go back to, you know, multiple times they played in the, in the Western Conference and the postseason and, you know, all these things that we've known that there's been, like, bad blood. And it's still sort of like, it's still there. You know, when they're talking about it's so much tougher to look like a genius coach without Timmy or David before him, such as life in the, quote, model franchise. Things are cracking up now that the true glue retired. And you're like, oh, shit. Like, this is like legacy NBA beef. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you my favorite. Oh. Specific. Okay. Yeah. It is the Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union tweets. I sat next to you at the Beijing Olympics, Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union, and saw you both being rude, nasty to little kid fan. <laughs> Had to eat your pizza. You showed no respect <laughs> to this little kid. Who are you to stand on high grounds? Never looked at Dwayne Wade the same after that. And then it came out, Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade responded to it, saying that they weren't there, right? Well, no, I think it was that Dwayne Wade was there, but he wasn't with Gabrielle Union. Right. Uh, like that, there, this, I'm not sure. I don't think it they was were something like that. dating at that point. So Gabrielle Union was not there and was like, oh, I guess I just look like the woman who you saw him with. Really good. <laughs> really good specific. Yeah. I would is while we're all giving our favorites. I think my favorite was was her trying to hook that kid Brian Jacobs up with his daughter or whatever. Like the like seems like he'd be a good guy to date or whatever. It was a very 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 upsetting exchange. The layers just keep yeah. going. It is. Yeah. I want to know how much uh, how much University of Chicago basketball you watched. How much Mattia Colangelo did you like? Did I did you not watch any. Nothing. I you did didn't try. I did try to find some of the games that I did look up. Look up the games that were mentioned on the occasions that the burner accounts also mentioned. Mm-hmm. That. I did not watch a lot of uh, University of Chicago round ball. Sure, because I mean the best conclusion to this would be you going to a ton of University of Chicago games, thinking actually. Mattia has game and starting to talk about him as the Sixers should give him a 10 day. Like you'd be believing in him as a They got some as, roster as spots. Player. Yeah, you believe yeah. in him. <laughs> uh, what, yeah. what are the. Um, we can get back to you. And Spike can ask the Sixers question a little bit. But what. The source thing is still very intriguing to me about who it, haunts you. About who it is. It, a little. Just in this, I just want to know. I like. I want to know the motivations because it's not the the full story has not been told. Um, what I know, you never talked to the source on the phone; it was just through email and text, I believe. Um, yeah, that's correct. Would what what is your guess? As I'm not going to do that. Not, uh, no, as to whether or not they will eventually reveal themselves, not who they are. Oh, 
Um, I don't think they will. You think it's I, a, you think it's a never? I mean, maybe down the line. I, I would say for this, I believe that they are anonymous for a reason, and whether that's personal or professional, I mm-hmm. couldn't necessarily say. But if you had this information and you wanted to be the person who was responsible for, you know, coming, like creating this story, I wouldn't have had a story without them. If they wanted that credit, they easily could have taken it already. Yeah, I, I have, I, my theory is that if it is somebody with a stake in it, like if it's somebody who was pretending to just be a normal person, we will never hear about it. But if it is just a regular person, I just think people say things and like the the odds of this person saying something to someone else to someone else to someone else um would like i just think it all end up coming out the story's too big you're walking around swinging your dick or whatever mm-hmm. you know getting recognized at bodegas and this guy or girl is getting nothing and i think eventually they're just going to slam their fist down and say you know what the burner story is mine and that I, would, that I would be it. totally fair i would yeah <laughs> <laughs> like you know, what am i going to say no dude <laughs> of course, they have every right to be as anonymous or as yeah. or attain as much notoriety as they want. They right. were the ones who who found the these these strange coincidences and started putting it together, and then brought it to me as someone who could help flesh it out and then present it on a, on the public stage. Like they are entitled to anything they want to do. Uh, your thoughts on Jerry Colangelo's role, not necessarily in this, not to say that he was responsible for the tweets, I wouldn't put you in that position, but uh, after the fact, uh, in, his, in his role in whether to keep Brian along or to stay with the organization or whatever. I don't really know what his role is with the organization at this point, if he has say-so. I, I saw the recent stories where he seems divorced from the, the organization but still has a ring on until like the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if he still has any clout or power, which could also, if he does sort of make current events more complicated. Um, from what was reported that he tried to uh, threaten the team. And again, this is not anything that I reported, but it was reported that he was kind of saying I will do damage to the Sixers organization if you get rid of Brian. I think that's understandable. They're the sort of the first family of the NBA and he's going to try to use his muscle, the same kind of muscle that got them into the Sixers organization in the first place. I I did not read that and think that doesn't make sense or I would do something different if I was in his shoes. Do you think he'll ever, do you think Brian Colangelo will ever get another meaningful front office job in the NBA? Um, I don't know. I don't really want to speculate on that. Okay. I, you know, I, I I don't know, man. Sure, sure, sure. Do you think you will get a front office job in the NBA? <laughs> uh, definitely not. <laughs> will you speculate on that? <laughs> yeah, I'll speculate. I will not get an NBA front office job. What, Although, what do you think? The funny thing is I have oh, you know, I've talked to a few players and like, I players seem to kind of like the story. In what in way? In in the way that it was a sort of a pro player story, I, I guess. And I didn't really know that that's how it would necessarily be digested. But it comes off as like, oh, this was a story that protected players. Yeah, I mean, I guess because you know, so often players are under the microscope, and you can't do this, you can't do this, and. Here's this guy who's running the organization who has all, all of the power, especially considering his lineage, the, all the power that any GM in the league really has. And, and he still feels the need to go make up these fake accounts or, or talk about this in some way. Uh, I think it's also that players seem to be bothered by criticism on the internet, mm-hmm. anonymous or otherwise. And in this case, it was sort of your paranoid delusion playing out and then there was you know an expose on it we're like what if that's actually my gm or my or, right. or like my coach that's on the internet saying that i don't pass enough and what if they're leaking information to the press about me that's negative and this sort of harnessed i think a lot of those concerns and sort of and, and then and then exposed it so I, I think i had never really thought about that until right now 
but I could see why players would think that this was something that was sort of taking down their foes in a way. We interrupt this podcast. It's not an interruption. It's informative to talk to you about one of our sponsors, our longest sponsor, that is L.L. Pavorsky and L.L. Pavorsky Jewelers. Mike, there's something very important about to happen in the, the coming weeks or months at L.L. Pavorsky Jewelers. Why don't yes. you ask me what that is? Oh, you know uh, what it is. It's the fall cabana sale. No, there is no fall cabana sale. And it's not time yet for the holiday party. What it is, is the uh, the hundredth rights to Ricky Sanchez engagement wow. ring purchased from L.L. Pavorsky Jewelers. He is up to 98 engagement rings sold to rights to Ricky Sanchez listeners. And in the coming weeks, somebody uh, will buy the hundredth rights to Ricky Sanchez engagement ring from L.L. Pavorsky Jewelers. It's so unbelievable. I can't even really put it into words. Right. So unbelievable that we, again, have zero proof that any of it's real <laughs> and truly can't take ll at his word yeah like i only well i've met maybe eight of them oh and by the way happy birthday to walt meredith who was the first uh right Ricky sanchez listener to ever buy an engagement ring from ll bavorsky jewelers so ll is a fine gentleman we kid a lot but um a great jeweler who does right by all of our listeners and a great person and a uh, sort of a scary rights to Ricky Sanchez and Sixers fan as well, which is exactly who you want to buy your expensive jewelry from. If you want to buy an engagement ring from Lee, make an appointment first so he can know all about you and uh, and really make the appointment worth it. 215-627-2252. Go to llpavorsky.com. You can email him or just tweet him at llpavorsky. And, uh, and you will not be sorry that you did. For every podcast, LL makes generous donations to Coded by Kids and the Providence Animal Center. LL Pavorsky Jewelers. Real or fake, LL will give you, a, people like you, a ring. <laughs> Real or fake? I don't buy it. A hundred is too many. Yeah, way too many. Too fast. Um, all right, now back to the podcast. Yeah, yeah that, I, I will say that the thing that you heard about players and how they felt is similar to what I heard. You know, like they, I, I think um, there is a, uh, like, a, a, there's an obvious trust barrier that I think they, they thought was broken. But of all the criticism that comes on the internet and all they have to deal with, the fact that it was coming from somewhere within is is like the the line that was crossed is you know that 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 they have to deal with all of this stuff from reporters and from regular people but to have to deal with it from somebody internally is the the ultimate line that was crossed and to be in their position there's probably a degree of paranoia about where stuff is coming from and this right almost validated those concerns uh i i can't let you go until i ask about it being a normal collar and <laughs> someone needing to find a new slant. I want to know if that if that was the line that you thought would go. I don't want to say viral, but become the the reference point. I had I had no idea. You didn't know. Yeah, we were it's putting, so great. We were putting together a, a bunch of the quotes that we wanted to put in there, and they. When I say quotes, I mean the the, the tweets, mm -hmm. and most of them focused on the sort of topics we were talking about before. The, physical or trade rumors or work ethic of players and the sort of the crime that had been committed here that, that we were referring to. And that was one where we're just sort of showing the breadth and the minutia of the tweets. And I mean, it was, I thought it was funny. I had definitely had no clue that all of a sudden, like find a new slant would be <laughs> like a, a catchphrase. I mean, I read it like three times a day from people all over yeah. the place. Like if you're on Twitter, you just keep reading it and, yeah, I think it's I think it's hilarious that that ended up being sort of the the talism of of the story. Yeah. Well, in, in many ways, it's never going to go away. In many ways, it's the most damning thing because no one that's not him, him or related to him, would say that. There's just yeah. no way. Well, it's obviously not a normal collar. It's obviously not. <laughs> it's it's specifically not a normal collar. 
Uh, ben, uh, you know, because of those quotes, I went home one day and put a collared dress shirt on my dog and took a picture of it because of those tweets. That's the sort of reach that that ends up having. I, thought, I mean, for Jason, years, find a new slant, and that is a normal collar. Jason we'll, Concepcion we'll on. wearing like the huge, like vampiric collars Very on like, the NBA yep. desktop was was solid work. Um, All right, before oh, go ahead. Yeah, Mike. I don't even want to. I don't even want to hear Ben's takes on the Sixers this season. <laughs> well, I wanted to give him some rapid fire Sixers stuff okay, at the end. I'm looking, but if you want to keep going, I, go ahead. I, I'm all for it. I feel like let's let's keep it pure. Let's keep it. This is purely a journalistic, no takes podcast. I would ask. I, no, I would ask. I, I would ask. Do you think? How do you feel about Markel? And because the Markel story, like I think you, this story provided air cover for for how equally wild and more upsetting. The Markel uh, shot uh, circus was. Uh, well, these accounts talked a ton about Markel Fultz. Yes. And absolutely informed how I viewed that situation. And they were, you know, we're dealing with a bit of a, uh, and a narrator with an agenda and, and one that is not necessarily always reliable for that reason. At the same time, they were very clear about this being, for the most part, psychological. There were, at times, references to an injury. But for the, but in general, when they talked about Mark Helfoltz, it was that it was the yips, that it was mm-hmm. anxiety, that it was mental, that it was in his head, that he was someone who had been cleared to play and it was up to him and he was more or less refusing to play. And that Brett Brown had said to him, hey, you ready to go? And he was supposed to play this specific game in Orlando and then just didn't. So when I viewed that situation, I was looking at it through the lens of these accounts that I was following for sure. And I mean, are you asking me what I think going forward or, or just, yeah. you know, I'm saying my, my opinion is kind of what I read on those accounts, to be honest. And now, and now going yeah, forward. Yeah, I... Um, it's like a really fascinating situation. I don't think an NBA player having the so-called yips is as rare as we pretend it is. If you look at guys like Joe Kim Noah and Iguodala and Andres Biedrins, um, there's Nick Anderson. Yeah. I mean, there, there are situations where guys have suddenly just lost the ability to make free throws and guys who were reliable free throw shooters suddenly start shooting in the you know, 25% from the line. And I think that's a similar kind of situation we haven't necessarily seen it with a jump shot. I, you know, I don't know how those, I don't know if many of those have worked out well. So, you know, it's hard for me to really put the fault situation as this total anomaly because there are a few examples of it, but it's also like, we just don't know. And when people are like, I think the Sixers are going to be fine this year. Like faults will be great. It's like, I have no idea. How does any, how do any of us have a clue what he's going to look like as a player? I, I, I find it impossible to speculate on what he'll look like on the court. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, the idea from them that it was on him and he could play if he wants and it's the yips and blah, 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 which I, I all believe, but is not the only thing that like that, that front office pushed out in terms of putting responsibility on players. You know, when Embiid wasn't playing back-to-backs, um, and the the organization was getting some pressure as to why he wasn't, and I'm talking about last year. All of a sudden, you know, the the leaks came out that it's up to Joel when he wants to play back to backs. Like he can do it whenever he wants. This is not us. And and the you know we, we don't know if he's going to play until five minutes before the game. Well, that's on Joel. Like it it was a constant stream of responsibility on anybody but the people in charge of the Sixers. And I, I thought it sort of lined up nicely with those things. So if Mike gets one Sixers question, then I get one Sixers question, and mine will be this one. Since Brian Colangelo was let go, or they agreed that he would no longer be general manager, the Sixers have not had an official general manager. Uh, Brett Brown appears to be the final say on basketball decisions, and the the triumvirate of Mark Eversley, Ned Cohen, and Alex Rucker seem to be making... Uh, most of the GM type things. What is your your take to put on your takesman hat of what has gone on with the GM search and the GM situation since then? Well, from the people I've spoken with who have um, associations with the team and knowledge 
to a, an extent of what's happening in, in that building. There haven't been any GM interviews. That's what I've heard. And that there's nothing that contradicts that that I think any of us have heard. I don't know of any rumors of, oh, they actually interviewed this guy. No. So when I've heard they have done zero interviews, I generally think that's more or less accurate, even if it's not a fact that I know from my, you know, from myself. And I think when I look at the situation, they didn't want to fire Brian Colangelo. They didn't want him to resign. They were content with this front office as it was. So when they were put in the position of him leaving the organization and then saying, we need to find a new GM, they weren't really trying to shake things up. I know from some ties to people in the organization, there were some people that thought this could be an opportunity to hire someone who is the best basketball mind available and that this could be a, an upgrade in the front office. But as it turns out, it seems apparent that they don't want to make a change. They don't want to hire someone. They were content to keep rolling with who they have. And if that's the case, I would prefer them just say it, you know, to have this information that they went to Daryl Morey or uh, tried to potentially approach Buford. Like those are, those are, are fake. Those are, those aren't real. You didn't really think that those guys were going to leave their organizations and come work for Philadelphia. So to me, like why pretend to do a GM search? Just say, we like our guys. That's who we got. We like our guys. We like Brown, Eversley and Cohen. We're comfortable with them going forward. I mean, cause that's what they're doing, right? You know, I mean, yeah. that's what's happening yeah. here. You don't wait yeah. until after the draft, after free agency, after you start hiring scouts and other coaches and say, now we're going to start interviewing, what, when the season starts? You know, like well, the here's, the, here's the, the only uh, alternate theory I could offer as a defense is at the time that this happened, that it was unproductive and nearly impossible to hire somebody that they would have been pleased with. And, and even now, after the offseason, is, is also that way. So without committing to anybody they don't believe in internally, they're going to let it play out until they're in a position. But I, I, don't, I don't know if I believe that, but it might be like this happened at the absolute worst possible time, I think, for them to actually do a true search. Well, Hink, Hinky only left like a month, about a month before. And, and, and that, that process it. took very quickly, as we remember. Well, but <laughs> 75 guys in like four days. You're right. I just yeah. tend to believe that if you don't do any interviews, you're not interested in hiring a GM. Right. That, that's yeah. kind of that's my fair. nuts and bolts thing about it. And again, I'm not even criticizing them for saying these are our dues. We want to keep them. I'm just criticizing them for running sort of a, a transparently fraudulent GM search. Yeah. Two in a row. Well, Ben. Yeah, two in a row. Uh, ben, we truly appreciate your time. Obviously, we want everyone to subscribe to Cookies, your podcast. Obviously, it was your idea for those Ben Dietrich t-shirts and the Twitter <laughs> of avatar changes. I, I just I wanted to reveal that here, that that was not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else you want to you wanna tell people to do while you're here? Okay, all right. Well, I'll, well, see, you I, on, I uh, I'll see you on Long Island on September 8th. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, baby. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I need to... Um, so that was great. Ben was great. You asked him every question. You asked him the questions that I didn't even think to ask him and they were great questions too. It was uh, a long time coming. We had uh yeah. I honestly totally forgot about the <laughs> censoring the word but Oh yeah, well I that totally was one of your forgot. favorites. I know, I totally forgot. Yeah. It's, that's a, that's a, yeah. how how little we've thought about it because I think it's one of those stories where it is the it's it's so like over the top funny that like making more jokes about it is like just a hat on the hat. Like it's just it's like oh it's like too much. Yeah. It's already like enough. So now that we've had some separation, it was good to revisit it and get him on and and ask the pressing questions like, but. Why does it need to be censored? Yeah. And he didn't and he and he ducked it, by the way. He ducked that question. 
Yeah. Well, maybe he knows. Maybe he knows. Maybe he knows. All right. Uh, get your tickets to the live, Ricky. We will talk to you again this week. We uh, we may or may not have some cool announcements about the live, Ricky, this week. We haven't decided whether we're announcing them or not, but they are cool. Whatever whatever they are, they are cool. So we will uh, we'll talk to you later this week. Mike, are you down with TTP? Yeah. You know Buttface. We are the murderers there. That with the jail and we murdered the murderers there. Then with the hell and discovered the devil delivered some hurt and despair. Used to have power to push. Now I smoke pounds of the push. Holy, I'm burning the bush. Now I give a fuck about none of this shit. Two runner over and out of this bitch. Step into the spotlight. Bumpers and downers get done. I'm in a rush to be numb. Dropping a thousand ain't much. Come from the clouds on a missile.